Now, for as long as human beings have known that the stars aren't just little balls of light in the sky, but uh, that some of those lights are actually planets far, far away, we have wondered what if there was life in the universe beyond us. The search for life has been a never-ending quest in a universe that is much larger than any astronomer ever previously conceived, something we are still trying to understand. But instead of searching planet by planet for life forms themselves, astronomers are searching for planets that are habitable in the first place. Now, despite the vast expanse of the universe, the chances of finding something like that are extremely narrow because most planets can't meet even the minimal requirements in order to sustain life. And yet, last week was a major breakthrough for astronomers when they located not one, not two, but three habitable planets. To talk more about this discovery, I'm joined now by Ian O'Neill. He's an astrophysicist and space producer with DiscoveryNews.com. Hey there, Ian. So uh, what exactly did the scientists discover in the Lyra, Ly Lyra constellation, and what can we learn from this? Well, yeah, you mentioned that uh, in particular it was uh, one star system that actually contains two um, planets that are within the habitable zone of that star. Um, now, this system is of particular interest. It's called Kepler-62, and it's of particular interest because these are the smallest planets that fall within the habitable zone of the star that's ever been discovered. Now, this star is a uh, red dwarf star, so it's kind of different from our star. It's older and it's smaller and it's um, less bright. But these two planets actually orbit within the zone around the star that is probably just right, just the right temperature for, for, for liquid water to exist on their rocky surfaces. Now, we know very little else information. We only know if they're an orbital period. Um, and we know their size, they're about, one is about 60% bigger than Earth, the other one is about 40% bigger than Earth. So they're very close in size, most likely rocky bodies. But that's about all we know. So although it's very tempting to say these are habitable planets, they're certainly not Earth standard. And we also know that uh, with that scientists included in another scientific study, Kepler-69c is another planet that was recently deemed uh, habitable. But scientists have acknowledged that these planets are too far away um, to really know what they're made of, how dense they are, etc. So how do we know that they are can sustain life, essentially? How can we come to those conclusions? Um, we don't know. This is the main thing. This is the problem we've got because, as you mentioned, they're too far away. They're anything really over 800 light years away. I mean, these two, these planets are around about between a, a thousand and uh, 1,200 uh, light years away. So they're really out of the scope for any spectroscopic analysis. So we can't actually look at the atmospheres if they do indeed have atmospheres. We don't even know that. We can't really look into the atmospheres to actually work out whether they got water, whether they contain the oxygen in the atmosphere. We don't know if they got carbon dioxide. We know none of these things. As I say, we only know two characteristics, is their size and their orbits. But that itself is very exciting because we know of one planet that's abundant with life, this planet, and it falls within the habitable zone of our star, the sun. So just using that as a yard post, we can say, well, there's a chance, there is a chance that these two planets, well, these three planets may well um, have the right, uh, right recipe for life on their surfaces. And if life is common throughout the universe, bear in mind we haven't got a clue if that's true. But if life is common, those were the, those are the planets that we'd actually put our bets on, and uh, the likes of the, the SETI Institute, um, SETI scientists who are actually looking for extraterrestrial intelligences, they will be directing their radio telescopes at these targets because it's our best bet. Now, as I understand it, NASA's uh, Kepler satellite is the one that actually discovered them, which is why the star and the planets themselves are actually named after that satellite. Um, and that satellite actually has more than 150,000 stars that it is actually keeping track of. So can you pr uh, describe to me what the Goldilocks conditions are for a planet to be considered uh, habitable? Basically, yeah, the star, I mean, um, Kepler is particularly interested in sunlight stars. I mean, the obvious reason for that is we know our star, the sun, can support life within this habitable zone because the star, our sun is kind of a, they call it an average star, it's certainly not average by any means, but it's not very violent, it doesn't fire out these super flares that irradiate all life on Earth. So we are very lucky in the fact that our world, we're actually here because our star isn't that violent, it's in a middle age part, portion of its life, it's kind of plodding along and it's able to support life in this habitable zone. Um, 
other characteristics of, uh, well, any, any star can be considered to support life, but with Kepler, they're actually looking for um, stars that are approximately the same mass as, as, as the Sun, because the Sun, as I said, is a good yardstick for uh, supporting life. And also, we're looking for planets that are orbiting within that particular star's habitable zone. So the Goldilocks zone, as it's called, it's not too hot and not too cold. So say if a planet was orbiting outside, further away from the Goldilocks zone, it's likely going to be frozen. So our interpretation of life, so bear in mind we're talking about uh, life as we know it. So life as we know it on Earth requires liquid water to, to, to evolve. So it has to be within this habitable zone. So too close to the star as well, that's no good because all water would evaporate and it'd just be vapor in the atmosphere. Um, that's not to say that other forms of life may not exist on these planets, but the point is we, we only know of one type of life and okay. this is it. So we're trying to look for any clues or any tracers that our form of life exists elsewhere in the universe. It's a very exciting discovery, although no one's going to end up being there anytime soon. Ian O'Neill, astrophysicist and space producer with DiscoveryNews.com. Thank you.